what we are looking at is um, essentially the way um, you know different uh, uh, victims or target groups or scapegoated communities have always been portrayed uh, throughout uh, European history in the last uh, five. Essentially, we're looking at a you know this sort of cartoonish portrayal or narrative. Uh, victims as the uh, carriers of diseases and cancers, yeah, uh, in the body of uh, 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 you know European society, healthy, but they're uh, you know uh, aff afflicted with uh, the presence of Jews and Muslims and whatnot, you know. Uh, and so, what we, what I just, I mean, Sanuja just show is a recent um, cartoon, uh, you know, depicting, uh, uh, you know. Uh, symbolic or representative Rohingya person uh, portrayed as a Muslim Bengali coming from across Bangladesh, uh, you know, which shares the border um, with Burma, about 270 miles long river and land border. So you could easily walk across, but now the, the border is extremely tightly controlled. And so this, you know, border crossing is no longer possible. But anyway, the Rohingya person uh, carrying a little bag of uh, his uh, essentials uh, coming in and then, and, and then, you know, with the trail or a string of uh, COVID-19 viruses, you know, like uh, you, you would recognize it. Yeah, I, I use that picture because it's just so appropriate. We are in the lockdown because of the pandemic and, and uh, we, here we are uh, in Burma in a country uh, you know, with the people that like to call themselves Buddhist. I mean, I, I was raised Buddhist, and every time I, the, the Burmese say they are Buddhist and then spit out uh, racist slurs against Muslims or Rohingyas or Christians, I'm extremely offended. Um, so this is a situation. But the portrayal of Rohingya as uh, viruses, um, it, it, is, it is the most... Um, what you call it, opportunistic uh, and, and uh, you know, from the Burmese uh, racist perspective, a timely portrayal because, you know, everybody is freaking out about the, uh, the, uh, the COVID-19. And so it's just one of many narratives to drive, uh, you know, home that this community, whatever their name, uh, is a threat to public health. Uh, before, the, uh, you know, uh, they they have been portrayed as a threat to national security. Yeah, and 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 I don't know, uh, you know, people study like, the uh, the Holocaust. Uh, you know, the um, the the sister from Palestine talk about uh, Zionism and all that. But you know, it, as early as 1919, Kaiser, the German Emperor Wilhelm the Second. Uh, portray the, uh, the the German Jews, the Jewish people in um, in then um, you know uh, the pre-Hitler, um, post you know First World War Germany uh, as basically parasites you know that 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 are growing or mushrooms uh, that grow on the beautiful German oak tree. So if if you paint people as like parasites and you know uh, the the viruses or the the weed, well, it's simple. The solutions prescriptive. If you're confronted with a virus, you've got to find a cure to kill it. If you're confronted with a parasite, you know, like you have to remove it. So th th these portrayals have the essential element to make a case that what we are looking at, it is sim not simply the case of uh, exclusion or the um, you know removal of a people from the soil, but essentially eradication, extermination, yeah? And so in 1919, Willem II um, uh, wrote to one of his field marshals uh, saying that, you know, the, these parasites, the Jews of Germany, who who had overstayed their welcome by the, you know, uh, German Aryan nation, ought to be guessed. 1919, they ought to be guessed. Yeah, I, I understand, I'm not talking about the, um, uh, the, the, the Holocaust here, but I'm, I'm drawing a parallel, you know, here, between what transpired 
uh, you know, it, uh, following these discourses in Nazi Germany later after uh, Hitler came to power in 1933 until the, uh, the end of the Holocaust in 1945 when Auschwitz and others are closed uh, by the Soviet Red Army and, and Allied forces. So now back to the Rohingya. I mentioned that Rohingyas were portrayed as, um, you know, a threat to national security. Well, this is the language that came primarily from, um, you know, uh, uh, from the military or military minds. And the reason is this. We have about, you know, 16 or 17 different Muslim communities that are scattered across the country. And uh, we are a patchwork of different ethnic regions, uh, you know, a, a country that borders on, um, you know, China, India, Thailand, Laos, uh, and then a long coastal line, about 1,300 miles, you know, in the Bay of Bengal, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, and then like going into the Indian Ocean. And, and so only the Rohingya of these uh, 16 or 17 different pockets of the Muslim communities, only the Rohingyas are located in what, uh, you know, the uh, borderland studies, uh, you know, people like Jim Scott were called borderland people that can have, uh, you know, by demographic or by cultural or even by national identities, you know, they can belong in Chittagong, which is in Bangladesh, or they can belong in Burma. And so they're, you know, so these are the pre-nation state people whose presence and whose history predates the coming or the emergence of new nation states, you know, which uh, came into uh, existence after the forced dissolution of European colonial powers, you know, uh, uh, empires. You know, in, in our case, Burma. Burma was annexed as a province to India, and then later released as a, a, a separate, uh, you know, colonial entity. And and so, Rohingyas happened to be right next to then East Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, uh, because East Pakistan became uh, Bangladesh after the bloody war of independence in 1971. And, 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 and the Rohingyas and the, the uh, you know, neighbors that are known as Chittagonians, they speak, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess like their language similarity uh, is, has 60% uh, overlap. Yeah. But, but the, you know, the, you, the Americans and Canadians speak um, English. You don't call them English. They will be offended if they're, you know, branded as, uh, uh, you know, English simply because their, na their native tongue is English. Yeah? And by the same token, Indians and uh, Singaporeans, a great majority of them speak English. You don't call them English just simply because they're linguistic affinities or even speak the same language. But in our case, uh, the, you know, we call them uh, Bengali. Just because that they speak, um, you know, a, a similar um, a language that's, uh, you know, uh, the, the, akin to their anthropological uh, brethren across the street. And so the military that after independence, alongside the, um, the civilian government, when Burma adopted a parliamentary democracy system upon independence, one year after India became independent. You know, uh, they became independent in uh, August of 1947. We became independent in January 1948. Uh, essentially, the, the independent treaties were signed about the same time. Uh, our uh, civilian nationalist leaders held off the celebration on the on the advice of the astrologer that said, uh, you know, if, if you wait until January 4th at 10.30 in the more, I mean, sorry, 4.30 in the morning, uh, that's more auspicious. And we have to we have not seen peace or prosperity or freedom since. You know, is is you know the astrological advice is is such that we are in such a mess. Uh, you know, long running uh, conflict of seventy plus years. Now, now they are portrayed as um, a national security threat because they happen to be right next to the second large, or no, not second, one of the largest uh, uh, Muslim countries in the world, Bangladesh, yeah? and so. They are preemptively, uh, because the, the reason, um, you know, the, the, the military uh, uh, the strat uh, the strategists and planners 
uh, that came up with is that Bangladesh is an extremely populous nation um, with the uh, land area smaller than Burma, with a lot of swamps and a lot of, you know, natural uh, prone to natural disasters because of the Bay of Bengal cyclones and whatnot. So 150, 160 million population um, in Bangladesh. If Bangladesh decides that it wants to expand its um, um, its territory so that its people can have a uh, you know a, a more living space, uh, I, I understand I'm, I'm using this like a Nazi language. Um, you know that's how SS called uh, to consider the uh, the, um, the Poland and other, uh, Ukraine and other places living space to make the Germans uh, more comfortable, and so they they project the uh, uh, the, the uh, military planning to acquire land from other people. And so so reverse that logic, the opposite. The Burmese thought that if the Bangladesh decide to you know snatch a piece of like adjacent uh, Aragon or Rakhine state. Uh, the the Rohingyas could be used as a proxy yeah, because they share uh, Islam and you know our language uh, as common traits. Yeah. So so what we have is essentially a preemptive genocide. Yeah. And and, and as a matter of fact, you know uh, the, when when we, when people say like uh, the, you know Rohingya conflict or conflict in Rakhine State, well, no. In so far as the Rohingya people are concerned, they don't have a conflict. Not with the Burmese, who are the dominant majority. Not with the military, who is armed to teeth. You know, this is the second largest army in the whole of Southeast Asia after Vietnam. You know, we're, we're uh, and and so Rohingyas are not out to um, to create any problems for anybody. And and the only thing is that they want to live on their own ancestral land, which is a borderland that goes in between, like you know, like old empires or kingdoms. Yeah. Uh, this, I mean, like uh, that's introduced in like uh, Poland. Uh, you know, Poland goes uh, uh, between different uh, imperial hands depending on who's uh, who's who had a dodgy design on Poland. And and so Rohingya wanted to live in their own ancestral country or land, just like you know Tibetans and the uh, Palestinians. You know, Nakba, the same thing. Yeah, the only I mean, uh, you know, in, in the case of Palestine, you know, I, I have a lot of Palestinian colleagues and uh, comrades, and I told them, look, yeah, you you are definitely in the longest uh, genocidal situation, yeah, and, and you're not just simply ethnic cleansing. Okay, or you go away and go live in uh, in 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 uh, Jordan and don't come back. No, no, no. You you know, even if you stay here, we'll make your life you know uh, completely unbearable. Yeah, and and so let me. You know, these are variations of uh, also the other one is that the attack on the identity. You know, Israel, the Zionist state of Israel did not rec or do not recognize or have not act recognized Palestinian as an, uh, uh, you know, distinct uh, community. As far as they're concerned, Palestinians are just Arabs. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the same way, like, you know, the, um, the, uh, the this is official, you know, the, in, in the last uh, 70 plus year, Palis uh, Israel has not recognized Palestinian identity officially in in its official statements. Yeah? Um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the Burmese, uh, we recognize the Rohingya as an ethnic community integral to our uh, ethnic, um, uh, uh, multi-ethnic uh, society, uh, you know, uh, uh, officially, in speeches, and, and you know, one of my um, uh, late great uh, rel um, great uncles was a deputy commander in charge of uh, Rakhine State, and uh, you know, he was uh, one of the uh, key people who hosted the uh, uh, you know surrender ceremony of Rohingya people uh, that that was that finally felt that they needed to take up arms. And so in exchange for ending the armed resistance, Rohingyas were given everything, you know, equal and full citizenship, right? A uh, promise of the uh, development aid, uh, the end to like uh, discrimination because they happen to be a Muslim uh, in a, a predominantly Buddhist country. So to, to, uh, uh, to, you know, to wrap it up, the, um, we roll back everything. That they were given, cons uh, you know, legally, officially, and publicly all the basic rights, uh, you know, recognition of their identity. So today we have a situation where 
the Burmese Nobel Peace Prize winner, Aung San Suu Kyi, who was feted around the world, particularly in Western uh, countries, as this like liberal, the, the darling of liberalism, democracy, human rights. And she herself denies that she never pronounced the word Rohingya in her you know, own uh, uh, the, uh, the public statement. And, and, and uh, we have a situation where, you know, Buddhist society, predominantly Buddhist society, led by majority Buddhist monks, the most powerful national institution of armed forces that still, you know, backseat drives politics in Burma, and, you know, the most, um, you know, iconic, um, the, you know, uh, the uh, politician, you know, I mean, like Suu Kyi replaced Mandela because Mandela, um, you know, retired and Suu Kyi continued to rise in the eyes of the public, uh, global public opinion, um, you know, uh, global public. And so now all these like the liberal, illiberal, Buddhist, uh, spiritual forces, popular forces, they all work together. There are disagreements between these, um, you know, forces in Burma on the scope of the, uh, the democratic reform, uh, the pace of the reform, power sharing, all that. But they do not have any disagreement on the complete and utter destruction of this ethnic community that was once considered our own people. And that is why, you know, as a scholar uh, and, and, and as an activist, Facts are on the side of the Rohingya. I just cannot close my eyes and say, you know, I have to go with my Buddhist people. No, no, no. My country wrong is wrong. You know, it doesn't matter. And then so that's why I, I would repeat what the decisions that I have made to say that Rohingyas are being uh, genocided. It is still continuing on. And, um, you know, the ICJ, as you know, the, the, we have international legal instruments, and, you know, uh, that we have global governance structures, we have international law. These are instruments created, you know, to, to support, um, and to remedy any oppressive situation, whether it's in the Tibetan situation, you know, or the, uh, the Rohingya situation or Palestinian. The will is not there. As um, you know, the sister from uh, Ramalam mentioned, the will will not be there because the interest of the you know these and uh, um, you know monsters that we have created you know these like you know modern nation states they operate with the three hundred years old outdated notion of Westphalian sovereignty. You do what you want within you know uh, two communities. You know whether majority uh, dissidents or minorities uh, protected under international law, such as uh, the you know the, the Rohingyas or Tibetan. As long as you guarantee that your conduct, your mistreatment, your genocides, your war within your national boundaries do not disrupt the flow of international trade, do not disrupt the financial transactions. You see what I mean? And so. So these crimes, whether it's uh, crimes against um, the Tibetans or crimes uh, against um, the Palestinian people that's been going on since 1948 or against the Rohingya since the 1966 uh, uh, when the uh, uh, peaceful demographic engineering started uh, and then like, uh, you know, erupted into uh, the first wave of genocidal purge in 1978. And that was followed by subsequent waves. Um, and so whatever the, these crimes, whoever the victims and scope, scapegoated communities, what we are seeing is um, two things. Na national states committing these crimes in the name of race, religion, faith, whatever, uh, are grabbing their land. Yeah, uh, You know, it, these crimes are not simply ideological. When you kick out Palestinians, you get their orange uh, you know, groves and, you know, you got their lands and uh, uh, residents. Yeah, we people know Jeff, Jeff are oranges, you know, like uh, Palestinians were stripped off their economic means and well, you know, it's it, not just colonial. Um, and the same way, like, you know, when Rohingyas fled, you know, I mean, hundreds of thousands of hectares of uh, agricultural land that belonged to Rohingyas 
uh, were confiscated by the Burmese state and the armed forces and the uh, local vigilantes, uh, you know, from Buddhist community. So there is no solution uh, in any of these situations as long as Security Council is uh, uh, in coma. Security Council, five veto powers, the most anti-democratic entity in the world. And then none of the uh, permanent member has the right, moral, intellectual, or spiritual, to use the word, you know, freedom or democracy or like human rights. And, and, and these are like the biggest arms exporters, like, you know, the biggest, you know, sellers of weapons in the world. You know, we are fooled. I mean, they, they must, you know, all these like great powers must think that we are really stupid and, and low intelligent creatures to think that, you know, they would give us, um, you know, peace and stability and human rights. You know, this is all bogus. And so I think, therefore, none of these communities can reclaim their ancestral lands. None of them, you know, uh, um, can return to their own countries. None of them can expect peace and peaceful resolution of their, you know, tragic, um, you know, oppressions. Um, as long as these interstate systems, you know, prioritize profits and strategic dominance and control over human lives.